Today I present to you Amanda King. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yes, appreciate. welcome. Um, one of the things that actually caught my attention with your story when I was listening to you is when you heard Cher and talked about how he abused you and how you made excuses for it. So tell us, how did he all start? Well, from the very first date, um, I noticed that he was not a very nice person. He called me a foul name on the very first date. Most women would have been gone. I'm the kind of person I always try to find the good in everybody. I look to see what's there and I never try to think bad of anybody. So I made an excuse. I said, well, he's drunk because we had been out, had a few drinks. We'd been to Virginia and came back. And I just met this guy a few hours before. And my family knew him, but I didn't know him. I knew all of his family, but I didn't know him. But he knew all of my family, but he didn't know me. So um, long story short, I made an excuse for the foul language and the behavior on the first date. And that would become one of many, many, many excuses over the years that I would use to justify his behavior. I literally became um, a passive willing participant in the abuse. I literally had what would be considered as Stockholm Syndrome. What I does actually, that mean? I actually sided with him. I found excuses for why he was doing the things to me that he was doing. I felt sorry for him. And a great peril to my own life, I allowed the abuse to continue. And the um, sad thing is, it's not an overnight type of thing. It's a systematic sort of um, procedure. They start out abusing systematic. and- Systematic. Yes, wow. it's not an overnight thing. A lot of people think that, well, this person has allowed this person to abuse and they should have got away right then and there. Unfortunately, it wasn't something that happened overnight. It took time, it took a while before these um, behaviors uh, took root. It took a while. It really did. And once they started taking root by then, I was already invested. That's one of the reasons I came up with an acronym called KIB, K-I-B. They gotta keep you. In order to keep you, they gotta find someone that's a bit on the passive side. They, most abusers don't want women that's gonna put up a fight. Wow. That's not somebody they wanna deal with. So in other words, um, they, the abusive men out there or abusers, go for people that are you know not violent those that are nice yes and vulnerable pretty much the kind of women or men that are weak-minded or oh. not so much just being weak-minded but somebody that know that they're not going to have to put up with a lot of stuff from they're not looking for somebody that's going to challenge them or give them a hard time they want somebody that's going to be willing to be um underneath their control right receptive of the the abuse and exactly. you know the ill treatment that's what they're looking for and they're also looking for women that um have low self-esteem people really? that don't think very highly or very good of themselves um what we used to call back in my day cutie pie women women that were a bit up again cutie pie i like that. yes <laughs> the women that done their hair up and they got their long fingernails all prettied up they're not going for those type of women those are not the kind of women they're looking for they're looking for somebody that's a bit easygoing and soft. Somebody that's not going to give them a hard time or challenge them. Wow. They want somebody that they can take control of. And most of the women that think highly of themselves or they walk with their head held high. Oh my they're God. Not they're not going to come for those. those. No. They also look for women that don't have very much. I was on welfare and struggling with two small kids. Okay, here's Mr. Knight and Shine and all. He comes out of nowhere. Oh my God. Who is this guy with all this money, nice cars, he's dressed nice, wow, and he's taking an interest in me? Wow, this must be my lucky day. Wow. That's where it starts. That's how mine started, and I'm quite certain a lot of people out there will probably be able to agree that they may have been through similar circumstances. So that's how it started for me. And my husband and I, when we were dating, after the first date and a nasty name call, I was like, ugh, I haven't seen him no more for six months. Mm. Well, after six months, I'm still looking for this guy because I haven't had anybody to say anything like that to me. The guy I was dating, he was married. I didn't want to be bothered with him. He wasn't very nice to me as well. He was only out for a good time, and that was it. 
He didn't want to give me anything. I didn't have any money because I was on welfare, $200 a month. And I was trying to find work, trying to go to school to get a better education. I was trying to do something to better myself and really was lost, didn't know how to. Well, this guy shows back up after six months and we start dating again. And we'd stayed together ever since then for 35 long years. And he abused me terribly throughout the whole 35 years. And like I said, it was systematic. It didn't happen overnight. Once we started living together, the abuse became worse because now I'm stuck. I don't have any way to get out of this relationship. I don't have any money, which he's controlling all of the money because he's making all the money. He would never let me get a job. He, he, would, he would never let you get a job. Never. And you were educated. Absolutely. Once I did start going to college and getting some education, it became a threat to him. Wow, that's, um, that's really sad and that is so pathetic that a husband would treat a wife like that. Well, stay tuned. Um, she's going to tell us how he ended up almost killing her how many times. Join me on the show every Friday. Welcome back, Ms. Amanda. Um, Thank you. Such a touching story that you have, that you're sharing. Why didn't you leave? That's, um, Why didn't you just run away? Why didn't you walk away when he was abusing you? You know, that's the number one question that most people ask. Why didn't you leave? You know, um, many times I did leave. I left a gazillion times, but he would stalk me. And this was back in the 80s, so they didn't have the stalker law out yet. But so when you say stalk you, right? Yes. Can you be more, you know, layman language? Explain how was he stalking you? Basically, if I was able to get away from him, take my kids and leave, he would go to everybody's house in my family until they found me. Once he got there, he would start an altercation with somebody there until somebody either got hit, the police was called. Wow. So I stopped going to my family because I didn't want to bring that trauma to their home because they were starting to become resentful of me oh. coming there with this drama to their home, which I can't blame them. You know, but I was crying out for help. I need help. I'm going through something here. I'm being hit and I'm being hurt in my home where I live at with this man. He was hitting you, physically battering you. Yes. Putting his hands on you. Yes, black eyes, knots on my head, busted lips. Really? And that was very mild, considering the fact that one time he got angry with me and threw a frozen can of beer out of the freezer and hit me in my face with it. Wow. Another time I got in an altercation with him or an argument, and I threw an ashtray at him. Well, he picked one up that stood off the floor, one of those ashtrays from the 50s that stand about three feet tall, and he beat me in the top of the head with it. My goodness. And there have been occasions where I've been choked, and... He chokes you? Yes. You know, and at that what, point in what, time... What in the world? Yeah. I've been through quite a bit of beatings, and I've been hit with objects. He's used objects on me quite a bit. And you were still married? No, this was when we were just boyfriend and girlfriend. We were oh, dating. Oh, I'm done. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't. You were just dating this man, and he was physically abusing you, putting his yes. hands on you, and you were still dating him? Yes. No, don't tell me you went on to marry him. Before we got married... Um, some guy told him that I had touched him inappropriately. He took out a hunting knife and stabbed me in my left arm. What? Yes. Before you got married? Before we got married, he stabbed me in the arm with a hunting knife. My youngest daughter, Sherelle, was sitting at the kitchen table having breakfast before school. Oh. And needless to say, to this in day, she In front of your trouble. child? Yes. He stabbed oh, me with a no. hunting knife and I ended up going into shop. He called an ambulance. They took me to the emergency room. Well, when I got to the emergency room, I never told the, a doctor that um, he stabbed me. I told him I was breaking up a fight. And you lied to the doctor after you were stabbed by your husband? Absolutely. I can't. Oh, I'm having a fit. I'm not understanding to this day. Now that I am out of that situation, I look back and say, what the heck was I thinking? 
Did that you get wasn't that? even that wasn't even the crux of it. That was a part of it. I mean, that okay. was bad enough. All right, let's hold it. <laughs> well, I'm I'm just passing out here in the studio. Maybe I'm just by myself. What do you think? Leave a comment below. Come on, come on. And then um, seven years later would pass, and I figured, well, okay, after he's seen all this blood, you know, he would never do anything else to harm me. Well, seven years later, we got married. Okay, I'm going to mm -hmm. hold you on that. Did he ever, how did you make up? Like, you just came from the hospital and life went on normal. Did he apologize or... There was no apology because um, from his era where he grew up, at an apology from a man was like being uh, a trump, if you will. You know, men don't apologize to women. Women should listen to men. They shouldn't talk back and things like that. We had quite a bit of arguments over me talking back, and I told them I was already raised. You can't tell me what I can and can't say. I'm a grown woman. Well, that led to a lot of arguments and physical um, altercations. Well... I would always assume that now that he stabbed me and saw all that blood, he would be feeling sorry enough that he would never do that to me again. And so far, so good. Seven years has passed. The abuse still went on the name calling, and he's called me some very violent names over the year. I mean, vile, vicious names that I did not repeat on television. Um, January of 1996, um, he was cleaning a gun, and... I was laying in the bed and something... Were you, were you married then? No, we were still boyfriend and girlfriend at this time. 11 years has passed. Whew. He was cleaning the gun in the bathroom and I didn't know it. But I was laying down in the bed and something went past my face. Had I lift my head up, I'd have been shot in the head that day. And it hit the window uh, sill and it bounced off onto the table. Found out he was cleaning the gun and it discharged accidentally. Two weeks later, we went on a cruise. When I came back from the cruise, um, he wanted me to go to bed one night and things, and I was already in bed, and I said, well, I'm not getting up to come out to have a drink with you. I'm not feeling very well. I've taken a laxative, and I'm done. I'm trying to clean my system out and get myself together. He wanted me to come out and have drinks with him, and I told him no. So finally, he persuaded me to come out and have drinks. When I came out to have drinks with him, um, I had just got started. He wanted me to stop drinking and go to bed. So it was constantly ordering wow. me around. So I refused to go to bed. He picked up a bottle and a can and threw it and hit me with it. I Ooh. went in the kitchen to get a knife after him, not to stab him, but to scare him, to get him away from me. I put the knife back when he went in the bedroom. When I sat down in my dining room chair, I felt something pluck me in the back of the head really hard. And I put my hand back there, and I was like, wow, that really, really hurt. What the heck was that? When I took my hand back from there and put it in front of me, it was loaded with blood. At that point, I realized he shot me. Wow. So I turned around in my chair, and I said, I know you didn't just shoot me in the back of my head. I'm not understanding this. What? I got out of my chair, and instead of going the other way, I went after him. I was so angry that this man then pulled the gun out now. I mean, you stabbed me seven years ago. Now you shot me in the back of the head. What he is going on? He shot you in the back of the head. Yes. In your story, Miss Amanda, you had, you know, told me that you went on to marry him. Yes. After he shot you in the head. No, I had just married him about a year before he shot I you got in the shot. Head. Yes. First of all, while you were dating, he stabbed you. Yes. And battered you, hit you with a tray and everything, and you still wanted to marry him. And mm -hmm. a year after the wedding, he shot you in the back of the head. Yes. It is, I'm shocked. I'm actually shocked. Somebody got to wake me up. That mm -hmm. you lied to the police and lied to the doctor that you had gotten into an altercation and busted into a fight. Um, and you never told them that he shot you in the head. And no. And he had to tell the police that he was the one that did it. Why were you protecting this man? Well, I find out years later after I've um, gotten a chance to be away from that abuse and situation that I had become just as sick as he was. I literally Ooh. became 
not only a victim, but a protector. I was protecting him from the law and pretty much from him own self. I wouldn't allow him to suffer any consequences. So at some point where, so you're trying to tell me that those people being abused out there, when you stay with a person too long, you become a protector. Because. So there's a tendency that mm -hmm. you could be in an abusive relationship and you continue to protect the person from the law. Is that correct? And that's correct. That you become sick. just as sick in the mind as the individual that's doing the abusing. And like I said, it's a systematic thing. It's not an overnight thing. You feel sorry for them because you know that they don't mean to do that. But at the same time, it's putting your life in risk and in, in jeopardy. And thank goodness that um, my kids were even home a lot of times during the abuse. Right in front of your kids. Yes. That is, I'm, I'm just... I can't take that because how are you going to abuse a mother in front of her kids? You're just ruining the future of these kids. I know there's a problem going on in, in families. You don't abuse your spouse in front of your kids yeah. because it leaves a trauma in their lives. These children grow up abusing their spouses. They turn out to be abusers too because they will think it's okay. So mothers, teach your daughters not to accept any kind of abuse at all. It's not okay to abuse people. It's not. Yes. So, I mean, there are lots of abusers out there. Even women abuse other women. That's crazy. You go to people's inbox and you're inboxing them all kinds of nonsense on social media. That is, I just can't take abuse. Abuse is wrong. I it is care. wrong. And then here How you, you are protecting this man from abusing you. So if you're out there and you are the abuser, what I have to say to you is you have a chance to give your life to Jesus. That's all. You got to go to God to help you. I mean, this is crazy. You, Oh, please tell me. So how did your kids handle this abuse? My children became very angry with him. My family became angry with him. And um, I think about the time when um, the abuse started in the early 80s. I used to tell my mother that I didn't want to go back home. I would leave there, I would pack up and run away. And she would literally pretty much send me back there. Why? Because in their day, which I watched my mother go through abuse too. Oh. Her husband was Army, mine was Marine. And my life literally mirrored hers. Everything she went through, I went through. And I'll tell you more about it in an upcoming episode, but um, the abuse is horrific on both sides. The children are traumatized, the person that's being abused is traumatized, and the person that's doing the abuse is suffering from a lot of guilt, a lot of anguish, and I found out that the abuser uses that abuse and control over top of that person as a drug. It's okay oh, yeah. once they get the abuse out of their system, they got to do something to relieve that anguish and anxiety. And it, it, it builds up in like a plateau stage. It builds and it builds and then it becomes an all-out brawl. I've watched it go on for five days before it actually escalated into violence. So it may start out with some anger going on. The abused person tries to appease that situation and calm it down. But the next day, that anger, angry person still got it simmering below the surface. And at some point in time, it's going to come to the surface. Sometimes the victim actually helps it to boil over so they can get through it and get it over with. I've been there and we have literally like pretty much just do me and get it over. Oh. You know, because I'm tired of sitting in on these pins and needles waiting for the explosion. Most people equate it to walking on eggshells. I lived with a ticking time bomb. I walked through landmines. If I had so much as spilled a drop of water on the floor, it set off an explosion. Really? A drop of water. My kids left Kool-Aid on the counter one night. A drop of Kool-Aid. He got them out of bed at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning to come down. They still tell me about that to this day. And there's no appeasing these people. You can't reckon with them. You can't reason with them. You're never going to get them to understand that this is wrong what they're doing. And you always hope that, okay, well, maybe tomorrow something's going to drop out of the sky and get this person to change 
so that you can continue to stay in a relationship. You literally fool yourself into believing these people are going to change, and they're not. One thing I do know, after all the, those years of uh, the abuse, it's not going to end good. Mm. It's going to end bad. It's going to end horribly bad for somebody. One person's going to, to the jailhouse and the other one's going to the graveyard. Aww. That's how they normally end up. That's what happened in my situation. Whew. It does not end good for either person. And I don't know if you would say that there are two victims here. In a way there is because the abuser has been victimized some point in time by someone and hurt people, hurt other people. It's just that simple. And until they get some help, they're never going to stop abusing. So ladies, don't be fooled into thinking that these guys or the women, whoever's doing the abusing, is going to stop doing it overnight. They have to get some kind of help. And if they don't get help, something has to go horribly wrong before it, t before it ends. And as I was saying about the merry-go-round, a merry-go-round looks slow. It's the last ride nobody wants to ride, anybody wants to ride when they go to amusement park. I'm not getting on that merry-go-round. That's a tired ride. It's too slow. Get on the merry-go-round and try jumping off. It's not as slow as it looks. And you'll constantly look for an opening to try to jump off. We used to do it when I was a kid. It goes faster than it looks. But you're constantly on that merry-go-round until something comes along or some situation or circumstance and plucks you off. Mm. In this case, I believe God reached in and plucked us both off. Because he had looked down, he's tired. Yeah. You know, I wasn't put here to be abused. And a man that abuses a woman or a woman that abuses a man, you are dishonoring that person when you have to do things like that to them, when you feel the need to do that. You dishonor them as a person. Oh, wow. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Thank you. That is sad. That is sad. Yes. But thank you for sharing. Wow, that is so touching. Um, we're going to have Amanda back on the next episode. Um, stay tuned, share this video, and I want you to follow up with the next one. Um, next Sunday we'll be airing live, 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon. You want to you know, go to your Facebook Live and your YouTube and your, on the Now Network Fridays as well. Um, you know, Go straight to our website, thejemimashow.com. And you will catch this live right there on the Jemima Show dot com. Okay, um, we'll have the next episode where she'll tell us how he eventually died, and you will be shocked that it didn't end well. They got into an altercation, and Amanda had no choice than to shoot this guy. Thank you for joining us, domestic violence is evil say no to it because they went through this until someone had to die you don't have to stay there until you die there'll be no tomorrow for your kids you have a better chance to leave if it's not working it's not working abuse is abuse nothing justifies it and you're ruining a generation now you're going to raise kids that will end up abusing other people, becoming social media bullies as well, bullies in school. Abusers raise abusive kids that are angry and that's why they're in school. Look at the kids that are bullies in schools. You will see their parents are abusers or are being abused and they're angry and they're taking it out on other kids. Stop domestic violence today. I pray that God will help you. I pray that if your spouse is abusing you in any way, that God will give you wisdom and strength and deliver you from that abuse. Okay? Feel free to reach out to us. We have a counselor in the house, and she'll be joining us again next week. I'm going to try to get both of them together so um, she would listen to this story and follow up, and she's going to give you counseling on how to get away or identify domestic violence or an abuser, okay? Like our page on the social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and visit our blog. We have great news for you. Every day, if you want to know what's happening all over the world, the Jemima Show.com is the right place to go. 
So this episode is brought to you by Faith Financial. Faith Financial, we want to say thank you for sponsoring the Jemima Show. Thank you for being a part of the Jemima Show. It's amazing. Faith Financial is a financial company that gives you money for real estate. But commercial, if you want to start up a business and you want to get a property for a business, Faith Financial can help you with all the money from as low as $100 to as high as fifty to seventy to a hundred to even two hundred million dollars. Name the amount that you want. Faith Financial has it all. And you don't have to have good credit to qualify. Trust me, you just have to visit their website and fill out the application. And the website is simply www.faithfinancing.com. Faithfinancing.com. Again, faithfinancing.com. This is their website. And the code to use when you email them, just use Jemima, J E M I M A H, and um, you will get you know, approved. So long as you come through us, we have a special discount for you. We have, you know, ways that you can be approved. Okay. Faithfinancing.com. Use the code Jemima or email them that you came from the Jemima show and you will go through our own process regardless of your credit. God bless you. Like I always tell you, Stay in the arms of the Lord. That's where you belong. Until I see you next time as we continue the story on the life of Amanda in domestic violence, 35 years, which ended up to her husband dying. She's shooting her husband, and he died on the spot. Follow us next time. Till I see you next time, stay in the arms of the Lord. That's where you belong. I love you. God bless you.